In Mesoamerica, the realms of the dead and the living were never truly separated. In fact, of all the civilizations which we have studied thus far, the Mesoamericans are the one society in which no such separation was ever even attempted. Indeed, there's a continuity from the early village traditions of the so-called Archaic period about 8000 BC all the way down to the Aztecs of 1500 AD of continuing to bury the dead under the floors of their houses. So they never actually let go of that tradition. And as a result, I think we'll find with the Mesoamericans that this was a society in which the cult of the revered dead hung the heaviest over its society of all the great traditions which we have studied, heavier even than uh, the Chinese or even than the Egyptians. And as a result, the pace of technological development in Mesoamerica is the slowest and the most retarded by the force of the cult of the ancestral dead. As Susan, Tebby, uh, Susan Toby rather, Evans remarks in her Ancient Mexico and Central America, in AD 1520, the tool repertoire was still basically the same Neolithic assemblage that had emerged there by the end of the formative uh, period. We have no wheeled vehicles, no use of metal until very late in the civilization's development. There's no plow, no draft animals, nothing in short fancy at all. This was a civilization that was even more conservative than the civilization of the ancient Egyptians. And I think this represents even more than ancient Egypt, the, the true sequel to the, the societies of the pre-pottery Neolithic, where, as we saw, the entirety of human society was down in the underworld. Uh, the same will be said of this society, as we'll see, the dead hung heavy over the shoulders of the living in this society, and uh, more so than in, a, in, in any other civilization. Now, the function, you can also see this in the fact that the, if you compare the Mesoamerican temple, uh, that's at the center of all of their cities with the ziggurats uh, of the Mesopotamians or the pyramids of the Egyptians. You can see the difference here in that the central temple in the Mesoamerican city has a dead king buried underneath it, just like the pyramids do. But whereas the pyramids were separated out, the Egyptians at least separated the dead out into separate cemeteries and put them on the other side on the west bank of the Nile. The Mesoamericans did no such thing because the, the temple of the tomb of the dead king is put in the very center of the city so that the entire city revolves around the dead king um, and as the central founding ancestor of the city. And so they're, they're literally, these cities are necropolises, basically, in which the living are constantly living in the shadow of their great dead king. Um, <clears throat> so I want to start by looking at the Olmec culture. And the Olmec are really, uh, they're before the Maya, they're, they're the beginnings of the Mesoamerican civilization. And their time in the sun extends from about 1600 BC all the way down to about 400 BC. Um, and their first two cities are at La Venta, which is overlooking the, the Gulf of Mexico. It's on the north side there. Uh, La Venta and also um, <clears throat> La Venta and San Lorenzo. San Lorenzo is, is actually the earliest of the two sites, but La Venta is has been preserved better preserved there was apparently a rivalry between the two cities in which uh, San Lorenzo lost out and La Venta, La Venta rather uh, became the main city uh, long about 900 BC it became the primary city whereby uh, the cult of the Olmec dead was practiced um, so La Venta was built on a kind of an island about two miles square that was surrounded on all sides by swamps and at its height, the site occupied about 200 hectares, that is to say 494 acres, roughly. It was laid out like Chinese cities are on a north-south axis. And the dead, uh, the, these are the only tombs that we find in the Olmec, are buried at the northern end of the site in precisely the realm of the dead, which is the north. As we have seen in Chinese civilization, the realm of the dead was also there regarded as the north. Uh, so it is very possible, and I suspect it likely, that there's a connection between Chinese civilization and the Olmec culture, although American anthropologists tend to deny this, but the evidence is it's weighted in preponderance of the it, it favors that there the, the Chinese have had an influence from across the water here somehow. Um, so at Laventa we find the earliest surviving Olmec tombs, which have to have been of course royal tombs dating right from about a thousand BC. And due to the the, uh, the the humid climate and the sluggish muddy rivers and the acidity of the soil, uh, no bones have actually survived from these tombs. So they're located at the northern end of the site, just above the so-called Great Pyramid. There's a Great Pyramid uh, that was put together here, which is basically a kind of a large earthen mound that was about 30 meters or 100 feet high. and contained about 3.5 million cubic feet of earth fill. 
there was a protecting apron built up around the southeast and west sides of this structure and on the south side there was a, a projecting earth ramp or staircase which opened to the forum below which is known as complex b the dead are buried on the on the other side on the northern side of the pyramid here so i think what we can imagine is that uh, the Olmec ruler would have descended the staircase of the Great Pyramid while performing a ritual perhaps of auto-sacrifice in which he would wear, a, let's say, a white cotton robe while cutting himself with a stingray spine and perhaps spinning like a whirling dervish to splatter his blood in all four directions of the compass. And the crowd watching below would have been stupefied by this performance. But he would move forward with the weight of the ancestral dead in the north on the other side of the pyramid behind him, and he would have been inflecting their energies, as it were, southward into the city where the main plaza was. So as I said, uh, in the north, in the northern part of the city, there are five tombs in this necropolis, uh, what archaeologists call Complex A. They're closed off by a fence made out of rectangular standing basalt columns. Basalt was expensive for the Olmecs to use, and it occurs at only one other of their sites because it had to be imported from the Tuxtla Mountains far to the northwest. So they didn't use it very often. And on the northern end of this fenced enclosure, there lay this large mound, which our archaeologists call Structure A2, and within which Tomb A was constructed um, out of these basalt columns stacked up. Uh, um, we have these long, thin basalt columns. And we have 12 such columns supporting the sides and then five laying atop them on top of them, which was likely uh, a tomb, although there are no remains of an actual ruler inside of it. But inside the tomb, there was found a few bone splinters and some teeth of two juveniles. Each cluster contained sets of exquisitely carved jadeite objects. And so like the Chinese, the Olmec have continued the jade carving tradition that included four standing figurines, a seated female figurine wearing a tiny obsidian mirror on her chest, two ear ornaments, a clamshell pendant, beads, and a blood letter in the form of stingray spine. They often use stingray spines to cut themselves. Uh, and the burials had been placed on the floor and covered with red cinnabar, which, as we have seen also, that the Chinese used uh, red cinnabar when they sprinkled it on their dead uh, in place of the old tradition, extending all the way back into the Paleolithic of using red ochre. Now in tomb B, which was located a few meters to the south of Tume, there was found a stone sarcophagus shaped like an Olmec dragon, inside of which was found a standing human figurine carved from serpentine, a jade, light, a jade -like blood letter, and two large jade -like ear spools. In Tomb A, which lay between both of Tombs A and B, was covered, it was covered by a layer of horizontal basalt columns, coated also with red cinnabar and clay. Inside this one was found 108 jade -like celts and some other ornaments. Finally, with tomb C and D, these lay under mound A3. Tomb C was constructed of sandstone slabs covered with red clay. Inside was a layer of cinnabar where the corpse had once lain, while the furnishings had included three pottery vessels, an incised obsidian prismatic blade core, fragments of rock crystal, and a collection of greenstone objects, which included 37 serpentine and jadeite celts, two decorated jadeite ear spools and pendants, a large jadeite tubular bead, a jadeite perforator, two jadeite turtle carapace pendants, a serpentine figurine, and 110 jadeite spangles. Uh, and tomb D, the fifth one, seems to have contained a child burial. So this is the collection then of the royal ancestors that the ruling king, when he stepped down the steps and cut himself in his whirling dervish dance, would have had inflecting power behind him. Now there was also found here these large, the, the famous giant Olmec heads and to the north of this complex, there were three of these large colossal Olmec heads arranged in a loose line, all facing out like guardians to the north. Perhaps the north is the sinister direction here as it was for the Chinese, and perhaps these Olmec heads are there to scare off any evil spirits from coming nearby. There are two more of these heads uh, on the southern part of the complex, as though the whole complex were surrounded by these giant Olmec heads. There were a lot more of these, these, these giant heads at, at the side of San Lorenzo than here. But it seems likely that these Olmec heads were actually ancestor figures like the giant Moai on Easter Island. The headgear worn by these um, figures suggests the type of headgear worn by Mesoamerican ball players, at the end of which game the, lo the loser was normally sacrificed, usually by decapitation. And it's possible that the heads were portraits of dead rulers, as most archaeologists assume, but I think it more likely that the presence of the headgear and the fact that the portraits are confined only to the head suggests that they're meant to be representations of primordial ball players, the first such ball players, perhaps, like the hero twins of the Popol Vuh. 
So um, the dead as at this site, as in all other Mesoamerican cities, are revered ancestors who must be called upon for blessings on all occasions, and they're therefore incorporated into the very idea of the city itself. Um, so that's the main idea, is that the dead are actually part of the realm of the living. They never leave the, the Lebensfeld or the Domus in this civilization. Um, <clears throat> so this civilization, I think what we'll find is that, like with the pre-pottery Neolithic uh, A and B, this civilization was sunken down into the underworld, uh, what the Mayans termed Jabalba, and what the Aztec will later the Aztecs will later call Mictlan. Jabalba means the place of fright, and um, indeed the, Mes the uh, Mesoamericans, the Maya, regarded Jabalba as actually coming sliding out from under the earth in the nighttime and becoming the nighttime sky, so that the nighttime sky is Jabalba visible at night and then in the daytime it slides back underneath the earth. So once again we have a tradition in which the souls of the revered dead migrate up to the stars. Now there's a motif in Mesoamerican iconography that is found obsessively reiterated from the Olmecs to the Aztecs in which a human being is shown peering out from the gullet of the open jaws of a beast. The particular beast can vary. Sometimes it's an eagle, sometimes it's a jaguar or a caiman or some a fantastic creature, but it is the main motif of the civilization. You can think of the Aztec eagle warriors, for example, with the open beak, and inside you see the face of, of the warrior. On the famous lid of the sarcophagus of the Mayan ruler of Palenque named Pakal, we see him depicted sliding down the axis of the world tree with the celestial bird at one end and the open jaws of Jabalba at the southern end waiting to swallow him up. So that tomb is aligned on a north-south axis so that Pakal's fall into the underworld portends his rebirth as a circumpolar star, especially since the Mayans believed that Jabalba rotated at night out from under the earth. So Mayan rulers and nobles, uh, and Aztecs as well, always, always, always wore elaborate headdresses for public occasions, and these headdresses, without exception, are depicted as the top half of the head of a god with open jaws, while the missing lower jaw is meant to imply that the Mayan ruler himself or the personage is looking out of the mouth of a god. So the costume then signifies, and all of this imagery signifies that the ruler has been swallowed up by a god. And indeed, um, the whole idea in Mesoamerican culture is that the human soul has indeed been swallowed up by the great beast Jabalba. Uh, that is to say, this is a civilization in which the astral plane has been allowed to dominate completely, thoroughly, and totally, more so than in any other civilization in history. And uh, this is the exact opposite of what uh, I think Ignaton was trying to avert when he went to war against the spirits of the astral plane in anathematizing the funerary cults. He was trying to prevent this, and he was paving the way for the stabilization of the ego in the West. And with Moses and Homer continuing the tradition of the war against the astral plane, here we have the opposite extreme. That this would have been the Mesoamericans would have been Ignaton's nightmare, a society in which. Everyone is swallowed up by astral spirits, and no one is allowed to be an individual. No one can speak for himself. No one is a three-dimensional personage. Everyone is swallowed up by a mask and a god who speaks through him. And, of course, the corresponding result of this is that these astral spirits want blood. And this fuels the myth of uh, this, this fuels the need for human sacrifice, and the central myth of Mesoamerican civilization is the myth of blood. So this is the great civilization of the mask. I don't think there's any other civilization in history that can rival Mesoamerica for the ubiquity and magnificence of its masks and headdresses and costumes, whereas the Greeks, by contrast, uh, confined the wearing of masks to the performance of plays. The Mesoamericans wore masks and headdresses for every occasion whatsoever. Nowhere did there ever exist a space in which a human being was allowed to be just a human being. Everyone in Mesoamerican society pretended to be a spirit being at all times. Now what the mask does is it depersonalizes, it flattens out the human being, the three-dimensional individual, into a two-dimensional icon that no longer exists in a temporal flow, but rather dwells in an eternal latticework beyond space-time, like one of Plato's forms. So the human personality is crushed thereby. And when the human personality is eclipsed by a god, it is the god, not the person playing the role of the god, that speaks through him, and that god is always hungry for blood. So the near total erosion of the human personality in this civilization leads to its constant need for bloodletting. And the fact is, in Mesoamerican society, nothing could take place without the letting of blood. 
The gods and the ancestors would not heed your summons if you did not cut yourself and offer blood to them. So kings and nobles are always depicted in Mesoamerican artists cutting themselves in order to draw blood, since it's blood that attracts the spirits. There's a great carved relief that depicts this from the city of Yashchilan, which shows the noblewoman Lady Jacques drawing a rope studded with thorns through her tongue, and the results of her bloodletting are then depicted in another wall relief, which shows her cowering on the ground before the apparition of a vision serpent, which towers over her, and its jaws are opening up, and inside of it is the city's ancestral founder, Yat Balam, who is leaning out of the mouth of this vision serpent, who has come to say, like a, like a genie in the Aladdin story, what can I do for you? So, in order to get the ancestors to appear, one had to let blood. In order to make the crops grow, one had to let blood. In order to get the sun to, to go on its path, one had to let blood. So, blood was always being... This is the bloodiest civilization in history. Uh, I think it's even bloodier than the Hindu civilization in terms of its industry of human sacrifice. And everyone is constantly cutting themselves in the society to get the ancestors to summon forth and do their willing for them. Now, if we look back in the myths of this civilization, for the myth that, that provides us with the, the code for this, the prototype, we find it in the myth of Quetzalcoatl, who when he descends down into Mictlan at the beginning of the age of the fifth sun, he descends down into Miklong, which is the Aztec version of Jabalba, where he tricks the god of the dead, Miklong Tukutli, into allowing him to steal the bones of the human beings who had perished at the end of the fourth age, the fourth sun. And he emerges from the underworld, and he gives these bones to a woman named Siwakuadl, who grinds them up into a kind of flour and makes dough out of it. But in order to make the forms cut from this dough come to life, Quetzalcoatl and all the other gods have to stand around it and they pierce their penises and drip blood onto the dough in order to make these human beings live. And so that gives us the clue to the understanding of the bloodletting, which is to say that uh, since the gods gave their blood in the beginning to make human beings live, then human beings are constantly having to give their blood back to the gods as a kind of a covenant uh, to seal this and make everything happen. Everything in the civilization happens as the result of bloodletting. Now, as a result of this, too, notice that there are no monster slayer myths in Mesoamerican civilization. We don't find any myths of dragon slayers, since the dragon in this civilization is the vision serpent who's bidding, uh, it, who is the vehicle out of which the ancestor that you want to communicate with comes. And I think what has happened here is that the imagery on the bronze vessels of the Shang dynasty that we saw, which were made up out of dragons and tigers, which there were vehicles for the shamans to ride on the backs of to go to the other world to communicate with the dead, having this society become the basis for the whole civilization. It's as though the dead, instead of riding on the back of the dragon, just as the Chinese dead would often ascend on the back of a dragon up to the heavens, so here the dead ancestors don't ride on the back of the dead beast, or, or the great beast rather, uh, they actually come from out of its gullet because the human soul in this civilization has been swallowed up by the astral plane. And so bloodletting is going on everywhere. So there is no myth of the sacrifice, or, or there is no myth of the, the actual war against uh, the dragon. Dragon slayer myths don't occur here. This is a civilization that has given itself over entirely to the astral plane. Now, the only case or the only example I think of, there was no real kind of psychological immune system or defense against the astral spirits, with the sole exception of the ubiquitous ball game, which is found in every city. There, there are these ball courts in every single city. Even Laventa had one or two, um, which at a superficial glance would lead us to suspect that the Mesoamericans loved sports. But in fact, they didn't play these sports the way we play them for purposes of mere entertainment. They played them to the death because the losers were sacrificed in this game. And the game was a symbolic struggle of the forces of light against those of darkness and death. The ball courts were usually eye-shaped, and the game was played with two to four players along a central narrow depression wedged in between two sloping artificial hills. Now this V-shaped furrow thus created very much resembles the cleft in the earth through which the Mayan maize god is depicted as having emerged from the ground bearing maize plants. So it's likely that the design of the court was meant to replicate this V-shaped furrow, this rip in the earth, for the court is the world beneath the earth. It is Jabalba, in other words. And with the layout of the court, it's as though someone had taken a wedge and split the earth open so that we could peer down inside it in order to witness the ball game that was being played down there in Jabalba, where human souls struggled against the lords of death for rebirth in the heavenly realm above. And when you died, it was the euphemism for death was uh, one goes to play the ball game. But the ball, the ball court was 
the antidote, really, that the sole immunological antidote to the image of the swallowed man peering out of the mouth of the beast. It was the only defense mechanism they had. In other words, the only time we see them wrestling against the figures of the astral plane to assert their humanity and their existence against them. Um, now, the story of the Popol Vuh is really, it's one of the few great myths that has survived from this civilization, and it really is the myth that explains the ball court. So I, I think it's worth going into here to recount really the only kind of psychological defense mechanism that ever emerged in Mesoamerica against the astral plane. And the story in briefest outline, it goes like this. So before the hero twins were born, who are the protagonists of the story, their father Seven Hunapu and his brother One Hunapu are two ball, ball players who spend most of their time playing the game, but their playing is so noisy that the lords of Jabalba, who are irritated by the noise, send messenger owls to summon the twins to the underworld to play balls to play ball with the Lord of the Dead. Now the brothers accept the challenge and they descend to the underworld. There they play ball with the lords and they're defeated, so they're killed and their bodies are buried under the court. But the head of seven Hunapu is decapitated and it's placed on a calabash tree. So one day one of the daughters of the underworld lords named Blood Moon happens to wander by and she sees this head. She's fascinated by it. But when she gets too close to it, it spits at her and the saliva causes her to become pregnant with twins. She's fearful for her life, so she flees to the upper world where she takes up residence with the mother of those two twins, who is slow to warm to her. But eventually she gives birth to a new set of twins, who are the heroes of the tale, Hunapu and Shpalanke, who grow up to become great ball players like, the, like their father and uncle. So once again, the lords are disturbed. The lords of Jababa find themselves disturbed by the noise of the boys playing the ball game, so they get summoned down. But this time they go a little better, so they pass down here they're going to pass a series of ordeals and triumph over death. So they have to be put through a series of tests that are stations and it's very possible that these stations in the underworld correspond to astronomical stations along the signs of the zodiac. The first station was that of the dark house in which they're given a torch and cigars and they're required in the morning to return them good as new. So instead of burning the torch they substitute the brightly colored tail of a macaw for it which looks like fire to the sentries. And instead of smoking the cigars, they put fireflies on the tips so that it looks like they're lit. The next test uh, was the razor house in which knives that are supposed to cut them, but they tell the knives to go cut uh, animal flesh instead and the knives think this is a better idea, so they leave and go do it. The third test is that of the cold house, which they pass by shutting the cold out. Then they come to the jaguar house. When the jaguars approach to eat them, the boys simply give them animal bones to chew on. Then comes a house of fire, but it, that doesn't burn them. And finally comes the bat house, which is full of all these screeching bats. And they hide from the bats by climbing, they, climbing, they climb inside their blowguns. And at one point, Hunapu makes the mistake. He gets curious and he sticks his head out. And one of the bats swoops down and chops it off. And the following day, then, the lords of Jabalba use his head as their, their ball. So Jbalanke, however, makes a fake head out of a carved swash. Uh, carved squash, kind of like carving a pumpkin on Halloween, and he puts it on his brother's neck. During the game, they manage to switch the heads back with the help of a rabbit, and so Hunapu is restored to normal again. So next, the boys are summoned, and they summon uh, a couple of wise men, and they tell them that they're about to die, and that when they died, if the two wise men would advise the lords to please grind up their bones and sprinkle them into the river. So the wise men agree to this. The boys then construct a stone oven. They climb inside of it, while the lords watch, delighted, and when they're dead, uh, the lords grind up the bones, just as the wise men tell them to do, and they sprinkle them into the river. But in the river, they're reborn as catfish. And when they get out of the river, they're trans they transform themselves into a couple of traveling performers who can do magic tricks. For instance, they can sacrifice people and resurrect them again. And the lords are delighted by this trick. So Spelunke kills Hunapu and brings him back to life. So they've got this magic act, and the lords beg them to do the same thing to them. So the twins oblige them by killing them, but they don't bring them back to life, and that's how they triumph over Jabalba. So uh, they find their father's head, and they put the pieces of his body back together, and he is resurrected as the apotheosis of the maze god, and then the two boys ascend into the heavens as the sun and the moon. So the story shows us how the human soul falls, the seven Hunapus severed head in the beginning, which winds up in the calabash tree. That is the equivalent to falling down into the belly of the underworld, where the human is swallowed up by the astral being, and the boys descend down into the underworld where they defeat the powers of death and retrieve the fallen human soul and return back to the world of light. So it's the myth, the illustration of the myth of the ball court 
shows us the human soul, and it's the only example in this civilization in which the human soul puts up some kind of a resistance against the powers of the astral plane. So that's the central myth of the civilization and explains why we find this ball court all over this civilization. In our civilization, note that by contrast in the West, we are trapped inside of the machine, not inside of the spirits of the astral plane. Uh, if you think of a movie like Steven Spielberg's AI, which opens up with the image of the woman and uh, the guy taps on her head and her face splits open to reveal a robot underneath, that's the exact equivalent problem in our civilization to the Mesoamerican problem of the soul being swallowed up by the, the astral plane. In our civilization, the human soul has been swallowed up by the machine. So we've got a problem, a similar problem too. It's, it's just a very different problem. So um, that's the civilization and the primary relation that, uh, that it has to the afterlife. Um, I want to conclude with it by looking at a document, a scene from a 16th century document known as the Lienzo de, de Tlaxcala, uh, which depicts the Spaniards being attacked by the Aztecs inside the palace stronghold at the Aztec capital city of Tenochtitlan. And it shows the Spaniards trapped inside the palace, riding on the, their horses, brandishing long pikes against the Aztec warriors who surround them. And we notice the cannon depicted in one corner firing its blast beneath the image of the Virgin Mary and an icon of the crucified Christ. And it shows the Aztecs with their eagle warriors where the, the eagle's masks are opened up, or in this case there are jaguars. The jaguar's mouths are opened up and you can see the Aztec person who has been swallowed up on the inside. Note the difference there. The Spaniards are riding on the back of the animal, on the horse. The Aztec warriors are peering from outside of the gullet of the jaguar. So in the one case, the human being is depicted as hierarchically located above the animal, riding on top of it. But in the other, the animal has emerged victorious over the human. The animal slash astral has completely engulfed him. And I think that this image in many ways says it all. It sums up the conflict between the two civilizations. The conflict between the Spaniards and the Aztecs was that here are the two civilizations confronting each other in history, which were exactly opposed to each other in every conceivable manner, but especially regarding the position of the astral plane in the respective cultures. In the case of the Aztecs, we have the paradigmatic civilization in which a complete and total victory of the astral plane over the temporal, temporal world of human society has taken place. But in the case of the Spaniards, we have the great exemplar of the one civilization in history that has gone to the other extreme by expelling the astral plane from its purview. Um, Western Christian civilization is basically one long war against the astral plane, which has devoted itself to scouring and extirpating every demon, devil, and witch that it could find. This is the process that we, we saw that began with Ignatan's war against the astral plane. It continues all through the West from that point down, whereas as we travel east, we see the soul gradually further and further swallowed up by the astral plane. So now we've gone as far east and as far down in, into the underworld as we can possibly go, so now it's time to turn around and look at the West and look at the emergence of the myth of the Wonder Child and see what course the West has taken uh, in its development.